July, we're kicking off a new summer series today, and uh, really it's going to be over the next seven weeks, we're in this series that we've entitled This to That, and it's looking at the, these journeys that every one of us have to be on, if we're really going to be a disciple who makes disciples, that, that to be in this journey, growing, to see movement in this journey is pretty important. It's essential to actually be a follower of Jesus who helps other people become followers of Jesus. And so every one of these days kind of stand alone, but they also build on each other and what it looks like to follow Jesus. And, and we've entitled this series, This to That. Like you were this, but now you're that. That uh, it's really a journey from what you were to what you are and from what you are to what you will be. That really it's a lifelong journey. Every one of these journeys we're going to talk about is a lifelong journey. And the one that I want to talk about today has been described like this by uh, Roy Morant in his book, Spent Matches. And he uses this phrase, and I really liked it. We're going to run with it. Earner to heir. Earner to heir. It's really a journey of trust from earner to heir. How many of you have ever heard someone say, I got trust issues? <laughs> We probably, every one of us have heard someone say that, but I think if we were completely honest, probably all of us could say that. We've got some trust issues. At times, we mistrust when we should trust. At other times, we go all in trusting someone or something that we have no business trusting, that, that we should have actually gone in with great caution. We struggle with trust issues. And there can be many reasons for this and why someone does it and someone else doesn't. Maybe you've talked to someone who made a life-altering decision. You're like, you know, what, why'd you choose to do that? And they're like, well, it's because some guy said. And you're like, really? It just a guy said? And you're going to make a life-altering decision? Or someone else is like, well, I Googled and, you know, the, the, the explanation. But we struggle with trust. And maybe one of the reasons we struggle with trust is I think for many of us, we've gone through painful experiences where we were let down or disappointed or lied to or misrepresented or betrayed. And maybe someone in your life took advantage of you. They were unfaithful to you. They hurt you. And this was someone that you should have been able to trust. But in the end, you were hurt. And whether that was by a person or perhaps because of an experience you had in your life, maybe you directed that towards God. And you, God, I thought you were... In, he didn't come through like you thought he was going to, and so you felt like he let you down. And so you, you have these feelings of mistrust. And maybe it led you to a place where you're like, man, the only person I can trust in this world is me. Like, I'm the only one that I can trust. I can't trust anyone or anything else, which only led you to further despair when you came to realize that you too give in to temptation. You too are a sinner. You too get deceived. Just like the very first people who were created on this earth were deceived. And you find out, you know, I can't always even trust myself. I can't always trust my thoughts. I can't even always trust this heart that the prophets would say is deceived above all things. We struggle with trust. And our struggle with trust precedes anything you ever experienced. It goes way back before that. It goes back to the very first humans, Adam and Eve, who were living in paradise, perfect heaven on earth. It was paradise. God walked with them in the garden. I mean, it's, it's what's going to come in the future whenever the Bible describes that, that heaven will come down and God says, I, I will dwell with man and everything that's been lost and cursed in this world is going to be restored. I mean, this is going to be heaven again with God's presence here, but... It's what Adam and Eve experienced in all of its beauty. There was just one tree. It, it gave them choice when God said, you may not eat of that tree. And when Adam and Eve encountered the serpent, also called the devil, also known as Satan, the accuser, the liar, the thief, the destroyer, when they encountered him, all he did was begin to cast doubt on who God was. And he said to Adam and Eve, did God really say you can't even touch it? You won't surely die. Well, the truth is, not only would they die physically, but they would die spiritually. Yes, they will. He said, God just knows if you eat of it, then you'll become like him, knowing good from evil. And he starts to question God's motives. Maybe God's holding out on you. Maybe God. And in that moment, Adam and Eve began to trust a serpent over their creator. Miss 
misplaced trust. And when they put their trust into the serpent and the things he began to say. And then they began to trust themselves ahead of God. You know, maybe God's holding out on us. Maybe we know what's best. We know what we ought to do. They ate of that. And the sin in that moment, the rebellion of that, was they did not trust God fully. They put their trust in the wrong place. And as a result, the, the consequences and the curses that came because of their sin is just mind-boggling. It defies our explanation, and yet it is the explanation for why everything in this world is so messed up. It is the explanation why there's so much brokenness and disease and destruction and death and decay and pain. And I can only imagine for Adam and Eve just how astonishing it was to see the depths to which creation fell. I was actually thinking about this because I, I knew I was going to be talking about this text briefly. And it was on Friday. I was uh, laying on a raft at Table Rock Lake on that 100 degree day. The water actually felt really nice and was laying on the raft looking up. It was a partly cloudy day, so the sun was actually bursting forth in the clouds. I was kind of watching the clouds. It was a beautiful day. And I'm thinking about this. And all of a sudden, it was like in that moment, I just kind of had a thought, maybe to a greater depth than I've had before, about Adam and Eve and just thinking of any person who ever walked on this earth, they actually had a greater awareness of just how depraved, just how dark, just how far we fell. Like they, they knew what it was like to walk with God in a perfect paradise. That's heaven. They knew what that was like. And then to go from that to what came. They had to have been absolutely astonished at just how far, how depraved we really are, how unraveled this world became. To have a son kill, murder another son. To see the effects of, of creation and all the curses that came with that. To, to experience the fear that came when, at one time, mankind, animals did not fear one another, but now there was fear present. Sin entered the world and it unraveled everything that they knew. They would understand just how far that was because they misplaced their trust because they thought their way was going to be better and how wrong they were. And you know, as parents, how many times have we said to our kids, you know, trust me. Like, I've got wisdom and experience and knowledge and insight that you can trust me with this right here, right now. And then they, they don't. And they disregard it or they disobey it. And then there's a fall and there's pain and how heartbroken you are for them. Sometimes there's even hurt relationship because of it. And I mean, it's just, it's just a taste of what, a glimpse of what God goes through, how frustrating it must be for him because we don't trust him. Well, today, as we talk about trust, I want us to look at, at Scripture today from Titus chapter 3. If you have a Bible or device, I want you to open up to that, to Titus chapter 3, because it is God's word that is authoritative in our life. It is God's word that lets us see what we need to see today. And uh, as we read it together, Titus chapter 3 verses three through eight, I'd like for us to stand for the reading of God's word, that we hold it as authoritative in our life, and we're gonna listen to what he says to us right now. These are his words. This is his heart to you. And so as these words written to Titus, chapter three, verses three through eight, and to the churches there in Crete, in that area, here's what we read, and it's written for us too. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. I mean, that's what we were. I know we want to put this off like maybe someone else is like that, but you know, you were. You too had evil intent. You too gave into your selfish pleasures. You did this. He even says there was malice, like that's evil intent. Makes you think of malice at the palace, right? If you remember that. But anyway, it's like evil intent. This is what you were before God saved you. And then it says this, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. 
through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. Like if you're going to trust anything, trust this. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. And so, Lord, we thank you, God, for your grace. Lord, we thank you that you have justified us by that grace. Lord, we thank you for your word that we can listen to and we can hear. It is trustworthy. And Lord, I want to pray that as we hear this and as we reflect on this, that, Lord, it grows our trust in you and that there is a change in our thinking today that grows us even further on this journey of trust, that we are not earners, but we are heirs, co-heirs with Christ. I just pray that this would become a deep truth in our hearts today, and we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. amen. All right, you may be seated, and as you are, Paul is saying to us, you know, you were this, and it's quite the list there, but he's saying, but you can become that. You were this, but you can become that. You can become that because Jesus showed up full of kindness, love, and mercy of God. This is who he is, and he saved us. Not because of any righteous things you've done, that's for sure, but it's because of his mercy. He, he gave us rebirth through his Holy Spirit. He regenerated us, Titus says, by his Holy Spirit that he gave us. He gives us new life, he gives us new birth, and you're justified. That is a legal term. It means you're in right legal standing, not because you've done right, but because Jesus did. In other words, it means that you are counted righteous. It, it's the imputation of Christ's righteousness on us. It's like he counts us that way. He declares us that way. It's not because I'm so good. It's because he counts us as holy because of the righteousness of Jesus that we're putting our faith and hope in. Christ has done the work, not us. Who are you going to trust, your work or Christ's work? And this is just more talk about trust. In other words, it's this. Salvation, your salvation is by grace through faith, not law through works. It is by grace through faith, not law by works. There's only two systems by which you can be saved. It's either going to be by law and, and through perfect obedience, or it's going to be by grace, the grace of Jesus. That's it. Those are your two options. And every single one of us know we do not want to stand before God according to law and be held accountable for what we've done because we've all fallen short of God's glory. So the only way that we can be saved is by grace. I mean, it's two options, and grace is the only one. Law, it operates on the principle of works. But grace operates on the principle of faith, belief and trust in Jesus. The law system requires that you place your trust really in yourself to obey the law perfectly. Whereas grace is putting the trust in Jesus that he can save completely. Those are two completely opposite systems. And those who trust in themselves according to the law of God is not how God ever intended his law. All throughout the Old Testament, it was to point you to your need for a Savior. All throughout the Old Testament, it was to point to the fact that you needed a Savior in your life, that you fell short of God's glory. Even in the Old Testament, Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. It was faith, not his works. It was his belief, his trust in Jesus. And so it's not by law, it's, it's by grace. Salvation by works doesn't work, but salvation by grace does. Titus 3 is laying this out for us. What are you going to trust in, yourself or in God? Law or grace? We're justified by grace. It kind of sounds like what Paul says in Romans 9, 30 through 32, when he says, what then shall we say? That the Gentiles, that's anybody who was not a Jew, so that's most of us here, Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have, have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith, but the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. What, what Paul's saying here is Jesus was a Jew who came first to save the Jews. He came there. Those who believed and put their faith in him, they were saved. But those who continued to 
say, no, we're going to do it by the law and rejected Jesus. He's the only way of salvation. Only through Christ can we be saved. And because they refused him, he became a stumbling stone for them. They're just falling right over him. Because if you don't come to Jesus by faith, then you're just going to trip right over him. Because he is the only way into the kingdom of heaven. It's like God saying, no one's going to go to hell. I'm putting my, my son Jesus right here to keep it from happening. The only way to get there is to trip over him by refusing to believe in him. And that's the main point of Romans. It's not a contrast between sin and salvation. It's a contrast between two possible ways of salvation, law or grace. Which is it going to be? And since we've all sinned, and it's impossible to be saved by our works, salvation by grace is the essence that all the work of salvation has been done and accomplished by Jesus. He did it for us. And the way we receive that is as a gift. And we put our faith and trust in him. And here's the question, will you trust him? Will you trust him? And some of you say, yes, I'm gonna trust him. But then as you go through your life, you don't feel confident in your salvation. When people ask you, are you, are you 100% confident you're going to heaven? You say, I, I don't know. And you start thinking about what you've done or how you've earned it or what, how it came about. But you're not trusting him. Sometimes even through our actions and our words and our behavior, we're not trusting him fully. And it's hard for us because the earner mentality is embedded in our flesh. Everything we do is about earning mentality. Like in justice, you know, even justice. And in law, it's based on fairness. It's based on law. If, if, you, if you work for a, a business, I mean, mortgage companies, they don't operate by grace. That's not how they operate. It's a business. Businesses operate to make a profit, to bring about income. It's to be productive, effective. In the sports arena, players and coaches, you're rewarded and you're retained based on your performance and how you do. If you make the shot, you make the pitch. If you, if you win the game, you're retained. It's performance. If you go into the military, it's about rule following and rank and position and earning your stars. From the time you're in education, whether it's in preschool or from then on, you're learning that the performance is what makes the grade. It brings success. It earns approval. And while that's appropriate in those arenas, and that's how it ought to work or operate, when it applies to our salvation and our personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that is not how it works. It is rooted in grace, not in our works. A gift that is received, not something that we have earned. Roy Moran, in his book, Spent Matches, he says, no matter the distance from a point of conversion, when you come to believe and put your faith in Jesus Christ, when you repent of your sins, you're baptized into Christ. We saw Levi do that today. I mean, from no matter the distance from the point of conversion or the amount of knowledge they possess, it takes a lifetime to eradicate earner mentality. He says it takes a lifetime to eradicate that. He says, if your parents have high standards for your behavior, your education, and work, you might develop a pension to please those around you. That might be what you live for. He says, if your father or mother abandoned you early in life, you might develop a low sense of self and feel that you're not worth loving and you avoid deep connections. You gotta earn it yourself. You gotta do it yourself. You gotta pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's, it's about you. You're told to earn it even when you can't. You know, this week we're celebrating the 4th of July. Some of us already started. We did that on Friday, Saturday. Others, you, maybe Tuesday's a day for you to celebrate the freedoms that we have as a nation here at the United States of America, the freedoms that we enjoy, the values that we hold. We begin to celebrate those things, knowing that there were sacrifices made for that freedom. It's why on Veterans Day or other days, we, we honor those who serve and protect and because they've made sacrifices for us that have given us freedom. I, Wayne Bushnell, did not personally do that. I haven't earned it. I don't deserve it. I, I, I can't earn that. Not in that way. It's, it's given to me first by my creator and then also through the sacrifice of others. So I can't earn it, but I can choose not to waste it. It's like the the movie Saving Private Ryan, if you ever saw that years ago, where it's, it's, it takes place in World War II when some army rangers are given the task to go into the beaches, go to the beaches of Normandy and to go find, among all those soldiers, this one soldier who they didn't know exactly where he was, named Private Ryan, that they were to bring home safely. And that was their objective, their mission, their goal. And so they go into that war with that objective in mind. And when they do that, it, the film finally comes to this major battle, and it's the final battle where Captain Miller, who's been leading this team to go find Private Ryan and who found him, 
He's fatally wounded and he is dying. And with his last breaths, with Private Ryan kneeling in front of him as he's breathing his last, he just says two words, Captain Miller does right there to Private Ryan. And his two words are, earn this. Earn this. And he dies. And in the movie, you are given a glimpse of the weight of those words on Private Ryan. Because there's a scene where he is at the grave of Captain Miller, and this is now fast forwarding many years later. He's an old man with his family, and he is honoring Captain Miller. And he's by the grave by himself, but when he's back with his wife and his family, he's just, he's just basically asking, am I a good man? Tell me I'm a good man. He, he, he's reflecting on those words as if, did I accomplish it? Did I earn it? The weight of that was so significant. And I, I don't like to, I guess, be critical of a man's dying words, but perhaps a better phrase by Captain Miller in that moment than earn this might have been, don't waste this. Because nobody can earn that. Nobody can deserve that. But we don't have to waste the sacrifice. We don't have to waste what's been done for us. We can't earn our salvation. We're not good enough. We don't deserve it. Those who try to get into heaven by their own self-righteousness will never be able to get there. Earning your way to heaven is exhausting. It's elusive. It's why people give up on religion because that's what they think they're doing. Law mentality, it always leaves you feeling insecure in your relationship with God. It leaves you feeling as if you haven't done enough. It leads you even to legalism and self-righteousness and everything else to try to attain it. It's a turnoff to, to everyone else who sees it. You have to choose between law and grace as a system of salvation. You have to choose. And Titus will make it so clear, it is not by anything you've done. It can't be by law. It is only by grace. You've been justified by grace. You know, it was during a, a British conference on comparative religions years ago. Experts around the world were just debating the uniqueness of Christianity compared to other religions. And they were going over many different things. And some people even brought up, you know, incarnation, you know, God in the flesh kind of concepts. They were saying, well, there's, there's some versions of that in some religions where God appears in some kind of human form. And some people even mentioned the resurrection. And some of them said there's some accounts of a return from death. And they were debating this with all those. And C.S. Lewis, who's probably a name a lot of you would recognize, incredible author and apologist and he entered the room, and he, he said, what's the rumpus about? And he heard in reply that his colleagues were discussing Christianity's unique contribution among the world religions. And Lewis responded, this would, would kind of make me mad if I was struggling with this, and, but he's a smart guy. He goes, oh, that's easy. It's grace. So there was some discussion among all the conferees about it, and they agreed that the notion of God's love coming to us free of charge, no strings attached, seems to go against every instinct of humanity. The Buddhist has the eightfold path, the Hindu doctrine of karma, the Jewish covenant, the Muslim code of law. Each of these offers a way of approval, but only Christianity dares to make God's love unconditional. Only Christianity would say it is by grace that you've been saved. Through faith, you put your belief and trust in him, he saves you. You can't earn salvation, so by all means, don't waste it. You waste it when you fail to believe and trust him for it. You waste it when you fail to live and serve him because of it. You waste it when you fail to share it with others. You waste it when you trust him to save you, but you don't trust him to change you. You waste it. Roy Moran in his book, Spent Matches, says Dallas Willard reminds us that everyone is on a spiritual journey because we are spiritual people. The question is, what is that journey forming you into? Are you being formed according to the wisdom of God, Jesus, and the Bible? Is that what's forming you? Or are you being formed out of your own personal experiences and wisdom and attempts to figure out how to painlessly go through this life? Like, what is forming you? Jesus calls for an exchange of my personal style for relating to a biblical style of relating. 
he calls for this exchange of my personal theology to a biblical theology. And that can often be painful and counter, counterintuitive because that's not what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling or what I'm experiencing. It's an issue of trust. Who am I going to trust in these moments whenever I'm going through hardship? And here's an example that he gives. He says, if conflict avoidance fits my personal style of relating because I grew up in a home where conflict was never constructive and I learned to avoid it at all costs. He says, when, then when I begin to follow Jesus, I learned that he said, if one of your brothers or sisters has something against you, they sin against you, go to him in private and tell him what you perceive the wrong to be. Well, someone who avoids conflict at all costs because it was not constructive would not want to do that. My personal style of relating is now in conflict with the biblical style of relating. Who am I going to trust? Me? With my own personal experiences and what's gotten me this far? Or am I going to trust Jesus and do what he says, even if it's counterintuitive to the way I think? Even if it's not my personal style of relating? Even if it's not how I think it should be done? Who am I going to trust? Is it going to be Jesus or is it going to be me? Am I going to trust his word or am I going to trust my feelings? What he says to me about every area of my life, how I speak, how I think, how I act, how I behave, my, my moral choices... My thought life, all of it. Am I going to trust him or am I going to trust myself? And it's hard. Because many people, they, they start on a spiritual journey. And for some of them, they just want to find relief from the pain that they're in. They just want comfort and peace. And, and they want forgiven. They want life like to go really well for them, like really good. And when life doesn't, because we're in a fallen world, and things are painful and hurtful in that journey, and there's turmoil and pain, are they really seeking a connection to God to have a relationship with him and to trust him? Or are they only getting out of it their brief moment of personal relief? They struggle to trust him. God made us in his image so we could communicate with him. We could have a relationship with him. And the spirit comes to empower our bodies as we learn to walk with God and journey with trust. He's given us his word as a guide so we can lean into that and believe what he has to say. And that nature of deepening relationship with God is found in giving regular attention to him and accepting him and his ever-present attention to us. We have to move from trusting us to trusting Jesus. And that's the essence of Titus 3. That's why it says he saved us through the washing and rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Do you hear what he's saying? Because we've been justified, we are heirs with the hope of eternal life. He goes, this is a trustworthy saying. Like, this is what you can trust. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. Why do you do good? It's not for works to earn your way to heaven. It's because he has saved you. And you do this because the Holy Spirit lives in you. And you've been changed. And you're now showing your allegiance to Jesus through your trust in him. This is trustworthy. That those of you who have trusted in God, you're now heirs of God. Heirs. Your family. You belong to God's family. You're in his household. It's what Romans and Hebrews would say where it pictures Jesus as our elder brother. We're in the family. Hebrews 1 says that Jesus is the heir of all things. He's receiving all things. But it goes on to say, because Christ justified us, because he counts us righteous, we too are heirs. That's what Titus is saying. We're heirs with Jesus. Romans 8 verse 17 says, we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. That means everything Jesus receives, we receive. Everything. If we share in his sufferings, in order that we may share in his glory. As brothers and sisters with Christ, we will suffer in this life, but we receive everything he receives, all the blessings, even the glory. Why? Because we're children of God. We receive the full rights of his inheritance. In fact, the Bible says because we're children, we receive an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, and it's kept in heaven for us. We receive that. It's our our inheritance. Being a co-heir with Christ means Christ gives us his glory John 17, 22, his, or his glory and his riches. And 2 Corinthians 8, 9, and all things, Hebrews 1, 2, we're welcome as family just as Jesus is. We're accepted and beloved, Ephesians 1, 6. All that belongs to Jesus belongs to us. We've been brought into the family. We were lost. We were without 
But now we've been receiving everything we can receive. It's, it's kind of like if you, if you remember the musical play Annie, and it, it kind of contains a wonderful illustration of becoming an heir of God because when Annie moves from the orphanage to the Warbucks mansion, when she makes that transition, when she's welcomed into that, it is an incredible exchange for her. She leaves behind a spiteful, alcoholic caretaker, and she enters into a relationship with a caring father. She goes from having no possession to having a fortune at her disposal. The the hard pain that she went through led to a, a better tomorrow. And seen from a Christian perspective, she pictures what it's like to be a co-heir with Christ. Meaning, yes, we share in the sufferings, the hardships, but we also share in his glory. That in Jesus Christ, we have every promise of God. It means we've been placed through our faith in Christ, saved by his grace as a child of God, born into the family of God. He is our father, and we're an heir to all the promises by his grace through faith. We are family. We're adopted. We are children of God. So we must trust him. Trust him with our salvation. Trust him with our future. Trust that that it is God's righteousness that saves, not our own. So we trust in Jesus for saving, and not just for saving, but for living. This is why we do good deeds, as Titus 3 says. It's for saving and for living. We trust him. We believe in him. We obey him. And I just want to help you begin to think a little bit more along these lines. In fact, this week, we're going to have a a reading list for you that if you want to read some scriptures, this won't take you very long, but we got scriptures through Genesis into Exodus, Leviticus, and, and there's just short chunks all the way to the book of Acts. And this reading list, in fact, every week over the next seven weeks, we're going to have a reading list that you can, it'll help you go on a journey that will change your mind, your thinking from this to that, from earner to heir. And uh, you will find that, in fact, if you were to go to our website, northsidechristianchurch.net, on our sermons page, the list will be there. Uh, We will also send it to you uh, as an email this week. You'll get an email with this list so you can be reading scripture and letting God retrain your mind. Uh, It'll also be on social media, and we will also, it'll be on our app as well if you want to locate this list. But every week, we're just going to give you a reading list that'll help you allow the word of God to transform your thinking from this to that, from earner to to err. And the reason for that is because we all struggle to live with this burden of earner mentality. It's just wired into us. It's like a yoke of slavery that we carry. And we see it even in the New Testament after Jesus came and died and rose again, ascended to heaven. You had people who were called the Judaizers who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but who also believed in the works of the law to be saved. And so they added to Jesus the works. They were called the Judaizers. And it's made clear in Scripture. If you think it's Jesus plus this, if you think it's going to be works that gets you there, then you're, you're stumbling right over Jesus himself. You are saved by grace, a gift through your faith in Jesus Christ, in him alone, not in your works. Because they held on to that as their way of salvation, they were lost. Earner mentality is hard to let go of. And this is why we go on a journey from earner to heir in our relationship with God. It requires us to stop trusting in ourselves and our own efforts to please him, to trust who he is and what he's done for us, that he is sufficient to place us in his family. He can be trusted. This is why scriptures like 1 John 1, 9, that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and purify you from all unrighteousness. It needs to be a scripture we go over in our minds. Why in Ephesians chapter 2, when it talks about how we were dead in our sins, but we've been made alive with Christ, it's by grace you've been saved through faith, is important for us to remember. It's why when we actually lean into this, that joy is restored in our life because we have this gift and we live to please him, to live for him, not to earn it, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it's my prayer today that you could begin to live and walk with Jesus in this journey that will take you all the way from earner to heir, where you live every day with that awareness of what it means to fully live as a child of God. So I just want to ask you to do a couple things really quick. I want you just to close your eyes and kind of bow your head because I want to just ask you some questions. I want you just to ponder in your own spirit. I want you to think about these things, reflect on these, and just see what is the Holy Spirit telling you in this moment? The first one is this. 
what is the Holy Spirit leading you to do or to stop doing? Let's reflect on that. What is the Holy Spirit leading you to do or to stop doing? Are you ready to trust Christ for your salvation? Are you ready to trust him with everything? And if not, what's holding you back? Oftentimes, our lack of faith is what's holding us back. But if we were to put our faith in Jesus, here's the next question. Who could you share this scripture with? Titus chapter 3, 3 through 8. That you're not saved by your own works of righteousness, but you're justified by grace. That you were this, but now you're, now you're this. Who could you share this with this week? Who could God put on your mind right now? You could just talk about how God has used this text to speak to you this week. Then invite the Holy Spirit to reveal to you all the ways in which your salvation has made you a co-heir with Christ. Take a moment to reflect on what God has given you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are co-heirs with Christ by his grace. We thank you that we have the promise of eternity. We thank you that we've been redeemed, we've been saved, we've been healed, we've been raised to new life. Lord, we thank you that we are now recipients of your glory, that Ephesians would even say that we've been lifted up into the heavenly realms with Christ already. That's our standing, that's our position because that's who you've declared us to be. Lord, I pray that there'd be nothing that would hold us back. Because of co-heirs with Christ, we have the promise of eternity. We look forward to that day, that, that day when death will be no more, when pain is gone and mercy fills the streets and it's, it's ours because we have trusted in you. To whom else would we go? To whom else would we trust? to give us what you give us. And so, Lord, we want to trust you now with our lives, with our salvation. We want to trust your word, not our own feelings, our own emotions, our own thoughts, our own experiences. Lord, those have proven to not be trustworthy, but we trust you, the one who's the same yesterday, today, forever, the one who's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the one who holds the words of life, the author of life. And so, Lord, we trust you now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I just want to ask right now as you stand to your feet that we just use this as a time to respond. And and I just want to say this right now. If you have not yet trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you haven't put your trust in him to save you from your sins by believing he is Christ, he is the Lord, and confessing that you're a sinner, you've sinned against him, and believing that and repenting of those sins and being baptized into Christ to be raised to new life. If you've not yet made that decision, why would you put that off today? Let this be the day to come and make that choice. Make that, have that conversation. 
ask those questions that are on your mind right now. Whether you're in this room or you're online, if you're in this room, I'm going to be stepping out through Decision Point. I would love to meet and talk with you right there through those double doors to the right of this room. If you're in a seat, you can even take out a card in front of you and fill out that connection card and drop it off in the box as you leave and, and uh, uh, that are on the walls as you leave through the exits. And, and we will begin that conversation. Or if you're watching online, northsidechristianchurch.net slash decision to begin a conversation because that's the most important decision you can make in your life. So we just invite you to make the decision. But there also may be some, some ways in which we're just not trusting God with our lives. We're, we got trust issues and today we just need to place our life in the hands of the Lord. We need to pray for some things right now. And so our prayer team is going to be here. They're going to be at the sides of the room, down front on the sides. They would love to pray with you. They've already been praying for you today. They've been praying with people throughout the morning. They would love to pray with you right now. And I want to encourage you, if you're in this room, to go to our prayer team and just pray with them right now. Let them pray for you and maybe something or a circumstance that you're facing or you're going through. They're here for that. They're here for you right now. So go to them, pray with them. And then as you leave today as an act of worship, as you give to the Lord, you can see the ways you can do that on the screen or at the boxes at the back of the room. But let this just be right now a response to what God has done for us, that we can participate in his kingdom initiatives. And so I'm going to be stepping out these side doors. I'd love to talk and pray with you there. Go to a prayer person today and pray with them. And let's do that now as we sing.